welcome. My name is Caroline Colas. I'm the Senior Director of Health and Wellness at the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan. Tonight, we are going to be discussing medical cannabis for pain management and more with Dara Huang, MD. Medical cannabis is used more and more often as a treatment for chronic pain and to combat the side effects of chemotherapy, but it's still controversial and not lawful in all states. Dr. Dara Huang, We'll discuss the science and history of medical cannabis, how it differs from marijuana, and when and how it can be helpful for symptoms relief from particular health conditions. She will also discuss the required administrative process to get cannabis prescription in New York State. A little bit about our presenter tonight. She is a highly regarded medical expert and skilled dynamic public speaker, as seen in The View. You are divine, and you are brilliant, and you're a physician, and it's his loss. That's right. Crane's New York Business, New York One. Double board certified in nephrology and internal medicine, Dr. Huang earned her combined undergraduate and medical school degrees from Brown University, Brown Med School, as well as a master's in medical science. As the first foremost leader in both culinary and cannabinoid medicine in New York City, Dr. Huang is a trusted authority in medical industry, and general community education. In addition to practicing both mainstream and cutting-edge medicine, she has trained as a professional sushi chef under Chef Andy Matsuda. Hospital affiliations include Mount Sinai, Lenox Hill, and 2020 healthcare hero from New York City Health business leaders. Welcome to the call. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We are so very excited to have you here with us. Thank you so much, Caroline. Thank you, JCC, for this invitation. I'm so delighted to be here tonight to talk about an unbelievably remarkable yet controversial flowering plant. In medicine, it's not often that we see such strides and political shifts in the advancement in medical information and knowledge. The historical context is so rich, it's rooted in medicine, and it's been politicized for generations, for even probably more than vaccines itself, that it's affected nearly all areas of industry and society, from law to policy to profit-making to medical science, obviously, and even to race and social justice. But it certainly is a pivotal moment in our lives where we get to see such grand shifts in everyday living, even in our own neighborhoods, the changes that has taken place. Let me show you what's in the news. Back a couple of weeks, uh, the first wave of 36 retailers for recreational use have been approved, 12 of whom are in New York. There will be a total of 175 licenses that will be issued, 25 of which will be nonprofit. But this is rolling and rolling very, very quickly where we might be seeing the first recreational brick and mortar location by the end of the year. And you might ask yourself, well, aren't I seeing a lot of dispensaries already around the corner? I just did a quick snapshot of the smoke and vape shop and you can certainly see a number of locations throughout Midtown, Upper East and West side. None of these are licensed, by the way. So let's see what recreational is, what adult use is, what, how it differs from smoke shops and medical use. Just a word of caution, these unlicensed storefronts have a lot of claims in terms of products. Is it used for recreational use? Are you using it to enjoy? Are you using it as you would say alcohol or are you using it for a medical conditions? Being very clear as what the purpose is also determines where you might be seeking or the advice that you might be getting for medical or recreational adult use cannabis. An article came out soon after from the New York medical cannabis industry. It's more of a trade business representing the registered organizations. They state a lot of these unlicensed storefronts are not only illegal, but they also are contaminated with heavy metals, bacteria, and pesticides. In each variety of cannabis, you can do a fingerprint of its ingredients. For example, these are two varieties, cultivars, 
and there's a breakdown. The licensed and registered organizations and the ones that will be coming to New York reports the ingredients and if there's any contamination, if there's any pesticides, it's all regulated. So let's just go back a little bit. It's a very long history of medical cannabis stemming back from East Asia. The agricultural god Shen Nong, the beginnings of traditional Chinese medicine over 3,000 years prior, the Chinese emperor references hemp as popular medicine or numbing. The father of Chinese medicine, Shen Nong, also discovers the healing properties of cannabis. A lot of it was empirical. A lot of it was trial and error and trying things themselves. The Egyptians had also used this for glaucoma, for inflammation. In India, it was used in ancient Greeks as well. But it's typically seen as traveling from east and then moving its way westward. Fast forwarding into the 1500s, the Spaniards brought cannabis to the Americas. We have Sir William O'Shaughnessy who researched cannabis in India, and it was in the 1800s, a legitimate legal medical compound, part of the pharmacopoeia. There's many uses of the cannabis plant itself. There's industrial hemp, which I'll distinguish the difference, but there's the hemp or the cannabis plant that has the roots the stems, the leaves, the flowers. When you hear the word flower or the bud, where the medical components, THC and CBD, is richest in, that's what we're referring to the flowering plant, the flower itself, essentially the female plants. But the other parts of the plants, commonly known as industrial hemp, has other various usages, um, including textiles and paper. So what happened? So what happened was there was a lot of competition and propaganda that then occurred. There was the movie Reefer Madness that came out, the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. But really, why did this all happen from a medical plant that was used to help with pain and inflammation to something that was seen as illegal and illicit. This is Harry Anslinger, who was the first director of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics in the 1930s under the Nixon administration. And there was a campaign over 30 years to view cannabis as very foreign, illegal, and really a lot of it had to do with the competition of industrial hemp with a lot of the corporate barons at the time, including DuPont and the industry bigwigs. There was, again, the reefer badness, the Marijuana Act, and then the DA then put it on the Schedule 1 of the Controlled Substance Act, which it still remains today. But there is federal cannabis that is being grown, and this is only in one location in Mississippi, There are still four people who receive medical cannabis from the government. Over the years, it amounts to something totaling half a million dollars, and this is federal tax money. They don't take any new patients, so these are those who are left. Over time, you know, we see that there is a lot of use for the medical cannabis plant, not on the legal and political side, and putting that aside, but just looking at the health benefit. This is a more recent study in 2021 looking at CBD There was a total of almost 400 adult users, and a lot of them overlap, so that's why you'll have over 1,600 responses. And the most prevalent use is for anxiety, then stress, general well-being. So just calming the system down mentally, just taking the edge off, and that I certainly see that in my practice as well. Things changed, really, in 2013 of the interest in cannabis, but also how we viewed it. And there were a number of reports, particular with Dr. Gupta, who changed his mind on it. He did the research and investigated. We grew up with say no to drugs in the 80s, and this all remnant of the 1930s. And it's on the schedule one, which means that it's not used for any medical purpose at all. The other drugs that are on that list are, for example, LSD. Even opioids would be scheduled too. This is an older study, but evidence and recommendations for research were the studies that were shown to be useful for cancer, for chronic pain, and multiple sclerosis. I point out these three because those were amongst the first 10 qualifying conditions when New York State had approved for medical cannabis. Chronic pain wasn't on that list until the year after, but cancer and multiple sclerosis was. The 11th condition, which was chronic pain, and then followed by PTSD.
in terms of the news in 2017, when medical cannabis in New York was in its first and second years, and we saw older patients using it. This is a little bit misleading. In the first picture, which was the one that was used in the article, it looks like something very illegal and illicit, but actually when you zoom in on it, it's a vitamin water bottle. It's nothing behind closed doors at all. So take critical eye in terms of how things are presented and the news that we see. It's a changing landscape. This is in 2018. There were 30 states approved for medical use, nine for adult use, recreational use. And in that same year, a lot of things have changed. A lot of it had to do with lobbying. So when you talk about, you know, unifying the country and red states and blue states and Republicans and Democrats, this is probably one of the few unifying themes that everyone can, can agree on. Later that year in December, not much shift, but 33 legal cannabis states and 10 recreational. Throwing in politics with medicine in December of 2018, this is when Governor Cuomo was running against Cynthia Nixon, and there was a lot of talk about cannabis and legalization in that same year. Um, shortly after he was reelected, Cuomo then put efforts into legalizing recreational marijuana within months. And this is New York, so months is really not months. Months is really two and a half years. It wasn't until March of 2021 the Marijuana Regulation Taxation Act, MRTA, was actually signed into law. There was a lot of back and forth. There were a lot of committees, a lot of policy changing. And you can imagine that it did take over two years from legalization into actual law. Within that package, the medical marijuana program was no longer by itself medical. Use of marijuana, by the way, is um, rooted in prejudice. So we try to use the plant, the scientific word cannabis. I'm happy to see that they made that adjustment as well. The Office of Cannabis Management will include not only the medical cannabis use of which I'm part of, but also the legalization of the adult use. Some changes on the medical side. Previously, there were the qualifying conditions and each condition had to be associated with symptoms. So if I wanted to qualify someone for chronic pain, I had to show that they had chronic pain and then what it was associated with cancer, with nausea or cachexia, Parkinson's disease. So it was fairly limited in terms of what I could recommend the cannabis for. I certainly saw a number of patients, say, for example, who had insomnia or anxiety. The only thing that was along the lines of mental health care was PTSD, a very limited portion of what this plant could be used for. But now, under the new program, as a physician, I can choose for what conditions would be useful. It gives me a lot more flexibility into what I can prescribe or recommend for, how to do the dosing, and writing out that recommendation according to my experience and also what I've read and researched and not based on a list. The other thing that was added back a couple of months ago, certified patients can also grow their own cannabis plants, a limit of six, three mature, three immature. This was not possible before. If you look at the Office of Cannabis website, there's a lot of literature on how to do so, which still exists. Patients come and see me, register online, receive the card, and go for the purchase. I also educate my patients you know, how to proceed, what to take, how to take it. If this doesn't work, what's the next step, as well as the dispensaries and what they offer. And what they had offered prior was non-smokable only, no edibles, meaning an oral food form. The options were fairly limited, only having capsules or pills available, oils in the form of tinctures, sublingual tinctures that you put under the tongue, and vaporization, which is inhaled. And this is an example of a couple of dispensaries, Columbia Care, Vario Products, and Etain. These are the first three medical dispensaries that came into New York. There are additional products that are allowed to be sold, not only capsules and tablets, but you also have the chewables, lozenges, tinctures, You've got lotions, um, vapor, which had always been there. But now this is the big difference is the whole flower and ground powdered um, material can be also used for vapor form.
you know, in terms of how people advertise. This is a PhD, but when I looked into it was for handwriting analysis. There is Healing Properties of CBD and THC, a book about how cannabis helped her son treat Hodgkin's lymphoma. This would be considered anecdotal. So whenever you do your research, look at the studies, look at the population. Anyone who says that there's a cure to cancer, there's living with cancer, there's management, there's remission. But anyone who says cure, I would just stay far away from. Here we go again, can cannabis cure cancer? There's a lot of research that's still lacking when I see patients living with cancer. There are three main mechanisms, apoptosis, which is cell death the inhibition of growth, and also the inhibition of angiogenesis, which is spread. There's a lot of research being done, but one fix-it pill is not the case. So there's a lot of information that needs to be teased out still. And what about fibromyalgia? This is another source of chronic pain, particularly in women. I remember um, in medical school, we were taught that fibromyalgia was different points of pain throughout the entire body, mostly, in, again, in women. And if pain control wasn't effective, treatment options was to see a psychiatrist or a psychotherapist. Perhaps there's a deficiency in the endocannabinoid system, not unlike many other conditions where you have a deficiency like Parkinson's, you have a deficiency in dopamine, deficiency in insulin, in diabetes. Is it possible that fibromyalgia is caused by an endocannabinoid deficiency. I've learned in my practice, you know, to to really take a, a step back and be very humbled by the knowledge that we don't know. So what's the real story about cannabis? If I were to say that I had a magical pill, a miracle pill that helps with mild or moderate pain, it helps with arthritis, preventing heart attacks and pericarditis and heart disease and strokes and blood clots, you would say, no, that's not possible. That it's impossible that we have anything that could be all things for all diseases. But this is aspirin. Originally, salicylic acid derived from the bark of a willow tree, and it helped with headaches, pains. Before we had the science to prove it, the herbalists and doctors would try it little by little and, and see if it would work. So that was real empirical science. Many medications are derived from plants, a lot of chemotherapy agents, even opioids. I mean, this is originally a poppy seed, and you can't overdose on poppy seeds, but over time with synthesizing the active ingredients, it could be dangerous, obviously. Cannabis can be used to help reduce pain, and I uh, certainly have seen in my practice those who are on opioids and want to decrease the usage of opioids or don't even want to start to begin with have effectively used medical cannabis either as a replacement or as an adjunct. And what is cannabis? So cannabis is a plant, very simply. Um, there are three species, the sativa, indica, and ruderalis. We mostly hear about sativas and indicas within the cannabis plant. There are the chemical components, including the major cannabinoids, THC and CBDs. Within sativas, there's THC and CBD. Within indicas, there's THC and CBD. And then there's varying mixtures of both. And those are your hybrids. So it can get very confusing because the uh, nomenclature is somewhat confused. The recreational adult use, a lot of times they'll mention indica in the couch, which gives you a relax, makes you um, rest and stay in place, whereas sativas kind of give you a little bit more energy within the medical program. We didn't use sativas and indicas. They were all hybrids, and there were ratios of THC and CBD, which is still in use. High THC, that is predominant in the ratio. High CBD, that's predominant. And then there's mixtures of both where you have even or equal balances of with um, adult use coming in. Sativas and indicas are also being sold in, in the dispensaries as well. In terms of the science behind it, considered the father of cannabis medicine, Raphael Mishulam. Um, this is when went over to Colorado because there wasn't any good information, you know, that was available. So had to go wherever the sources, the direct sources were. His lab in Israel mainly looked at CBD and just identifying the endocannabinoid system. There are three components. There's the endocannabinoids. We naturally make this in our bodies. Anandamide and 2-AG are the main ones. There's the receptors that accept ligands. 
um, CB1 and CB2 are the main ones. And then there's the enzymes that make everything go. And the CB1 receptors are distributed mostly the brain and nervous system, but certainly throughout the entire body as well. So there are nearly every single organ. That's why there are so many different beneficial effects. And how cannabis works is this. The endocannabinoids, which we naturally make, found in mother's breast milk, where you have a high amount of anandamide, and that's why we have receptors for it, because we make this. What do the endocannabinoids do? The, the whole point of all of this is to maintain homeostasis, to relax, to eat, to sleep, to forget, and to protect. And we're talking about neuroprotection. The phytocannabinoids, we talk about medical cannabis, the chemical components that are plant-derived act on these same receptors, whether it's the cannabinoids that we make ourselves naturally or if it's from the plant itself, it all goes down the same receptors that we find in the brain and in our tissues. This is the phytocannabinoid side. The two major cannabinoids are THC and CBD. The THC is the psychoactive part of it when they're feeling euphoric. You also have the CBD, which is non-psychoactive. And each component, whether it's raw or heated or aged, changes. Each of them have its own medical benefit. And this is just a depiction of all the different benefits that CBD, CBGs, um, THCs have and how it works in the body. Again, the reason why it has so many different purposes is because we have these receptors on all of our organs. Lastly, the synthetic cannabinoids made in the lab, obviously. Marinol is FDA approved, used for appetite stimulation, namely in um, cancer patients or HIV patients. Marinol is a synthetic cannabinoid. It's prescribed. You can have your physician write if it's indicated. Um, but it is a synthetic cannabinoid. And I would also say that on the synthetic illicit side, you've got the high THC, the K2 and spice. I wouldn't even say that that's cannabis at all. It's not marijuana at all. It's something that's unrecognizable, which is why it's so dangerous. K2 and spice, it's completely unrecognizable. The symptoms of which is altered high THC. Um, this is not natural at all. This is as if we were plucking out vitamin C out of the orange. You can overdose on vitamin C, vitamin D, any of the vitamins, but you don't really overdose on the orange. And what we're talking about in terms of the medical cannabis side, in terms of the plant versus what's created in the lab is the difference between something that is created versus something that occurs naturally. The reason why the natural plant doesn't cause those effects is because you've got the entourage effect and you also have a balancing effect. Cannabinoids don't work well by itself. So back to the orange example, not only do you have the vitamin C, but you also have the water, the fiber, the terpenes within that. You have a whole host of things that don't cause you to overdose on it. This is what we mean by full spectrum or isolates. What you don't want when you look at the over-the-counter products is isolates because while they're trying to say, yes, there's no THC, you won't get high, but that's not actually how the plant works. You do want some THC to help CBD work and vice versa. The THC is the main driver of cannabis, but the CBD is what we call a negative allosteric modulator, which helps dampen and mitigate the negative effects of THC. This is uh, THC and CBD with all its various uses in medicine. Not only do we have major cannabinoids, which is the THC and CBD, but you have the minor ones becoming more and more in use. CBNs, CBGs, CBCs. In the medical programs, there are some dispensaries that have the CBN, which is helpful for sleep that doesn't cause the psychoactive effects that THC typically does when you're talking about treating insomnia. CBG is used for GBMs, um, glioblastoma, multiformes, brain cancers. Um, again, this is not something that we would say is the it product, but you know, a lot of research is still being done looking at not only the major cannabinoids, but the minor ones as well. You also have the other components of the plant, the terpenes, the flavonoids, I don't think fatty acids, the omega-3s, and olive oil, the fatty acids, oleic acid that's in there. 
arachnidonic acid is one of the precursors for aspirin and, and NSAIDs, for example, and CBD is certainly used as a anti-inflammatory medication. As I mentioned, not only do the cannabinoid have its usage, but you've also got terpenes and terpenoids used in medicine as well. So again, this is what the entourage effect is, is not just one component plucked out, but the entire plant itself used in concert. And these are some of the common cannabis terpenes, the limonene, pinene. This is also what gives its smell, whether it's a more lemony smell or more lavender. Each one has its unique fingerprint. And in terms of the difference between hemp oil versus cannabis oil, the hemp plant cannabis, it's the entire plant itself, but where the CBD or the THC is derived from is important because there's bioaccumulants in the roots and stems. The hemp oil is the industrial hemp. It's not where the medicine is. The medicine is in the flower and the buds. In terms of selling not licensed and not regulated, you can get away with the hemp oil um, because it has less than 0.3% of THC, which is the regulation that we put in law. Cannabis can be used with other medications as well, either as an adjunct to the opioids. I try to add on cannabis before taking any medications off because obviously it's not resolved. And so rather than making two changes of taking something off and putting something on, let me just add something. Let's get a regular working regimen going before I start taking anything off. A physician or practitioner is there to give counsel to see what the dosage is, what the ratio is, how to take it, what the timing is, and considering also each individual. There's interactions, medication interactions. It goes through the liver P450 cytochrome system. Depending on what other medications you're taking, the THC or CBD can either increase or decrease um, the levels of the other medications. So this has to be used with caution, particularly with uh, certain medications and their side effects and contraindications. So yes, it's a natural plant. Yes, it doesn't cause overdosing and it doesn't cause withdrawal and tolerance, but anything that's ingested and systemic, you still have to be cautious whether smoking marijuana is safe. So besides the health benefits, the smoking itself, you're burning something. Combustible paper that you're burning, it's not safe in terms of anything that has anything to do with smoking. Vaping is different though. Vaping is, is heated to a certain controlled temperature and it gives you a longer lasting effect that's maintained and regulated. So it's not just, it's combustible, all the medication is burned off and it's done. There is a range of temperature. So this is why vaporization is different from smoking. Question of what about the lung injuries, the volley, the e-cigarettes, Juul and other products. Again, unregulated, the vapor products in the medical cannabis program was never taken off, but the CBDs in coffee shops and smoke shops were all removed, thinking that it was vitamin D acetate, the vehicle of which it was diluted, was the issue there. Looking at the research, seeing where we are today and what we're anticipating, this is just you know, another study that was done on THC and cognitive function in mice, so looking at Alzheimer's disease, and is there a potential way to prevent or reverse cognitive decline in humans. We don't know yet. So I would never say this is going to help with your memory. It has to be done you know, in the test tube, in the labs, then eventually moving on to you know, animal studies and then populations in a controlled way. It's important to not only do the research, but look at what we're dealing with. We have an opioid epidemic that's frightening and more so um, every day. And certainly the pandemic didn't help this, but possible ways to mitigate the use of opioids and also still relieve pain and suffering. I think that's really important. And certainly I had mentioned pharmaceutical opioids at thousands of deaths, but in cannabis there hasn't been um, because we're using the natural plant itself. 
And just as a quick side-by-side, -side, April 2020, the, uh, the peak of the pandemic, you had 33 states legal for medical use with 11 legal for recreational use. And what we have today, considering also this past election, we now have 41 states in D.C. with medical use and 23 states for adult use or recreational use. So things have changed, still federally illegal, still a lot of proposed lobbying for this way or that, but it certainly is changing. You know, the political landscape is changing, the medical landscape is changing, and where we go, I think, in terms of doing research and looking into it on in a scientific basis is important. And just giving you some history of where we were, where we are, and where we're going. So hopefully that gives you a broad overview, and I can certainly be more specific with the question, so I welcome any questions you may have. And I have a YouTube that um, talks about cannabis and chronic pain, mostly in, in women. So this was an OBGYN grand rounds for physicians. So if you want something a little bit more specific with studies cited, then I have that available on my channel. Thank you um, so much, Dr. Horn. I wanted to ask a few questions. Uh, we have several yeah, sure. in the chat. We'll just take them as they've come in. Um, mm -hmm. Elizabeth did share that there was recent research, research that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association that suggests cannabis is no better than a placebo for treating pain. The placebo effect. And I think that's important to talk about because there's different kinds of pain. There's neuropathic pain, there's acute pain, there's traumatic pain, there's pain and suffering, there's discomfort. It does work on the, the CB1, CB2 receptors. We do see that there's benefit in terms of pain. Whether it's a placebo effect or not, it's still an effect. We use the general word pain, and I think it has to be looked at what kind of pain it is. Is it spastic pain? Is it neuropathic pain? Is it internal pain, acute or chronic? Word pain is very basic, covering all the different types of symptoms that we may have. Placebo effect is still an effect. And especially with my patients who have anxiety, and I think mindfulness would be very helpful, especially if it's a vapor form, something to reach for is comfort. While I'm working on the mindfulness with patients, something that you need to practice, this is something we're going to incorporate. We can at least reset so that we can have that practice. And then with time, the act of even inhaling is already a deep breath. What is the difference between medical cannabis and cannabis? It's just the different usage. So cannabis is cannabis. It's the plant. If you're using it to treat symptoms of pain or insomnia or nausea with chemotherapy, then seeing someone and dosing things out properly and being very prudent in terms of how things interact would be on the medical side of things and having some guidance there. But the plant itself is no different. The question is, is, you know, what's the difference between medical and recreational or even adult use? These are words, but semantics matter because when we talk about recreational use, now we're talking about for fun and no regulation and even for kids. So when we're talking about what's coming into New York, they are talking about adult use, which is 21 and up and regulated. Right. And the reason for that is it does impact the brain, correct? And especially for young people um, who are still developing and forming. There is, right. Has there been enough research to know what the impact on that is? NIDA, which is the, the National Institute for Drug Abuse, the research that they use, and if you want to get a NIH grant or funding, it's to show harm. Um, it's for drug abuse. And so, and namely, they do look at um, kids and adolescents up to the age of 24. Brain is still developing. There's too much plasticity, neuroplasticity that, Risky. you know, not only the physical, not only the physical addiction, but the social addiction as well. Great. Um, here's a great question. Why is there such a paucity of education on medical cannabis? Meaning, why isn't there more of it? Why is it so scarce? medical uh, education on that's a good question i mean i think a lot of it is because it's still on um it's still federally illegal so there's there can't be there isn't any there isn't good research that is nih funded and the woes that are funded is to show harm there's plenty of research there it's not necessarily government funded and it's very expensive to do those research that's not going to be somehow 
um, sponsored by, you know, some other agency like an industry. So that's one piece of it. And also it's, you know, so when doctors say, well, there's not enough research there, there's plenty of research. You just have to look for it because there, if you go to PubMed, there's more and more every single day, more needs to be known. And, gotcha. and I wish it was in the medical curriculums. Yeah, it's so interesting that you're saying that it's kind of like the positive psychology field. Uh, therapy used to be focusing on what is wrong versus what is strong. And you're saying in some ways that the NIH is focusing on what does harm instead of what are the benefits, right? Um, that's fascinating. Um, Melanie asks, why does it feel different for my tremor, whether I eat it or smoke it? Is that difference in dosage? The form of administration is important. So whether you inhale it, whether you ingest it is going to be different. Smoking or inhaling it is going to be the quickest onset, but it doesn't last as long. If you eat it, it takes an hour, an hour and a half for it to get through your gut. And it lasts for a longer period of time. So knowing how to use it, the form of administration and your absorption is going to be different. And by smoking it, it the tremors would respond faster than, than eating it. Do people have both dosages or yeah. do you only get one? In other yeah. words, I, I, I build up upon them, especially when it comes to sleep. There's issues with sleep initiation versus sleep maintenance. Sometimes we want to get to sleep right away, but then we want to take us the rest of the way. So sometimes I do stack different forms depending on what's going on. These are great questions, everyone. Camille asks, does it work for sciatica, nerve inflammation, or orthopedic pain? Yes. <laughs> in a nutshell, yes. Yeah, and can you tell us about, you know, there's different kinds of arthritis and some of those medications right. are really severe. Does cannabis work alongside them or in replacement of those some of those drugs? It could be used either or both. So there again, there's different kinds of pain. There's inflammatory pain, there's neuropathic pain. The sciatica pain, probably neuropathic pain. Inflammation is more on the rheumatologic side, like arthritic pain or osteoarthritis. That would be more inflammation. Orthopedic pain is mechanical. It's more structural. So these are different kinds of pain. And depending on the severity and the timing, whether it's predictable, for example, fibromyalgia, I, I have patients report, they feel it in their joints. They know when the rain is coming because it's worse. Inflammatory pain is typically treated with NSAIDs, the non-steroidal um, anti-inflammatories, but they come at the cost of also side effects with ulcers and also kidney damage. Neuropathic pain is typically treated with gabapentin or Lyrica. Those are the gabapentinoids. And orthopedic pain, which is more mechanical or maybe even it's inflammation, often be used opioids. The opioids go through the mu receptor. So these are different kinds of pain, each with its own treatment. The cannabis can be used because it does have overlapping effects without being toxic like an NSAID would be. Are there specific places just to get medical cannabis? Yes, there are specific places. There are now 10 registered organizations throughout New York State. Each of them has four branches. When I started, there were five, you know, we were looking at one dispensary at a time. The best place to go if, if there's any questions is the New York government website. These are the medical dispensaries that are legal. And those are the only ones that I turn patients to because those are the ones that have the regulated and quality assured products. Um, Lauren asks, please ask the doctor if she uses benefrine, B U P. R-E-N-O-R-P-H-I-N-E, -E, in her chronic pain practice. I strictly work in the medical cannabis. I, I don't write the opioids. If people are on Ativan or benzos or the opioids, then I take that into consideration and then try to add this on and then take anything off. Are there any benefits prophylactically for our health to be taking CBD or to be using medical cannabis? In terms of wellness and health, yes. there are certainly people who use it more like a, like a vitamin and just keeping things stable. I see them when they're on their sick side. And yeah, do you so. feel there is some evidence about that? In other words, let me tell you why. I recently interviewed Dr. Matthew Fink, who's a chief of neurology. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know him too. Lyle too. Cornell. And this question was asked of him and, and he was saying, you know, my kids, right? Someone said, my kids are trying to get me to smoke pot, right? But I've never <laughs> smoked pot. And they just said, it's good for me. It's going to make me relax or it's going to help my Parkinson's or my... And he said, listen, the greatest risk for our older adults, of course, is falling. 
So if you haven't had been smoking anything, know that it's a substance that affects your state. Your so, you, right, your cognition and your state. So you wouldn't want to start just for the heck of starting <laughs> because, yes. right? Because you want to, uh, you wouldn't want to increase your, your fall risk. Your, and I thought life. that was... CBD, again, you know, different from THC. So the THC is a psychoactive component that affects cognition and psychoactive effects. Within the medical program, these are all very microdose. These are very small milligram by milligram. I go one drop at a time even. So this is not those big doses that we're talking about that we see on the recreational usage. Does insurance so, or Medicare pay for medical cannabis? Federal program. So no. Medicare will not cover insurance does the no <laughs> that's I mean this is a problem. <laughs> short answer is no <laughs> short answer is no I could give you all the myriad reasons of what we're working towards until it gets off the list it's not going to be seen as medical that's going to be the the law I would also contend if you can prove to your insurance that instead of taking 12 different medications for sleep and anxiety and depression and pain that you can take this one thing maybe they might say you know what it's cheaper for you to take cannabis <laughs> and not pay for all those other medications can we switch to cancer for a second because i know oh. that we have some folks on the call and there and that is something that's dear to your heart and something you're very familiar with yeah. cancer treatment nausea all kinds of things not wanting to eat where do you see it being used and or even in your practice to really help with not only the treatments, but maybe post treatment. Is there any use there? Yes, absolutely. So I usually see patients when they're about to undergo or undergoing chemotherapy. So it helps with chemo associated nausea, vomiting, pain. And a lot of times when we're talking about the placebo effect of that pre anticipatory cycle of uh, undergoing chemo, sometimes it's pre-chemo that people feel nausea. It's helpful in relaxing the brain and just calming the system down in terms of anxiety that's associated with it. Also in the cachexia. So if you have poor appetite, the THC is what we're looking at. They no longer have symptoms, no longer have to continue, but some people still have anxiety and some long lasting effects, sometimes neuropathy related to certain chemotherapy agents. And so they'll continue as needed. We can always dial up and down in terms of what's going on. So I don't you know, just recommend one thing and you're on it for life and just see what's going on, what the situation is. Sometimes seasons change and, and so does one's symptoms. Yeah, our body is not the same. We had another yeah. question about any recommendation to mitigate munchies. So it's an interesting thing. So the cannabis plant is almost like a, a bimodal plant where if you go in one direction too much, the CBD will mitigate and bring you back. The THC is what we're looking at in terms of the munchies as, as far as stimulating the appetite. Beyond a certain amount, it helps with nausea. But if you have too much of it, it reverses itself and it can actually cause nausea. It's something called cannabinoid-induced hyperemesis, where you have too much THC at high doses and you end up in the ER because you have now created vomiting, the smaller microdosed levels it helps with nausea. And the same thing with the munchies, it helps stimulate appetite. But if you think about it, you don't really see obese pot smokers, you know, so it is an elegant plant. In Europe, there was studies to use parts of cannabis to help with weight loss to help with curbing the appetite. If you have the munchies with the THC, probably the CBD would help you the opposite way. Let's ask you a couple of questions. One is, it's an addictive substance. So is caffeine. If we are going off coffee, we feel the effects of it. What are the effects of cannabis, whether it's medical or recreational, if we're going to go off it or on it? Do we have headaches? Do we have lack of concentration? There's no withdrawal. No, there's no withdrawal. Ah. If they want to take themselves off, actually what happens is that they can reset themselves. So if they're using higher amount of it and they say, you know what, I want to just quit for a little bit, then you just quit. Your body readjusts. You take a drug holiday. And then we can restart again in three days at half the dose. It's like as if you're eating the same fruit every single day and you just become sick of it. Your body just becomes sick of it. Um, and, and so you just need to change it up a little bit. Just take a break, try something else. Sometimes I'll change high THC, a different brand. If people have always had chronic pain, it's progressive and there's no treatment other than just conservative management. If you take yourself off of it, it's not a withdrawal that you're feeling. It's the fact that your pain is back. Your pain gotcha. was always there, it was always underlying. It's not 
that you're having withdrawal. It's the fact that it was treating the pain. Here's an important distinction with medical cannabis and also these sort of unregulated, and you've even said illegal dispensaries or smoke shots. How does one know what one's getting? I would think that there would be some risk of saying, oh, I'm going to try cannabis and then going to the, the smoke shop that's around the corner. It, how do you know if it's, a, if it's legal or not? You don't know. Uh, so you don't know buyers beware so this is why i'm very concerned about the smoke shops because they could have spice the k2 cbd they can have thc but if it's unregulated you really have no idea and when it comes to things that you're putting into your body especially if you have cancer you know immunosuppressed it's risky don't take a risk my son has been using medical cbd during the weekend it has a relaxing effect however he claims he can't take it during the week because it affects his concentration any Mm -hmm. way that he can get that relaxation during the weekend uh, does he need to lower his dose any thoughts on that yeah it depends on what he's taking probably taking the thc's and just maybe changing up the ratio and having more cbd because even within the day i change up the prescription patients have for example high cbd during the daytime while they're working they can be functional have energy focus and concentration as the day wears on we're ramping up the thc so that they can have a good night's sleep So once again, we're really saying that every person is different and medical guidance is extremely important, especially when thinking about medical cannabis. And it sounds to me like since we first met, which was really a while ago when this was kind of a a new, that more doctors, would you say, can prescribe this now? Or do you need to go to somebody that has this as a specialty? Any doctor, if they have gone through the training, can prescribe through the Office of Cannabis Management. A list of physicians can recommend. The question is, have they gone through the training and have they certified themselves? Even if they've certified themselves, you know, and they're on the list, they may not necessarily give guidance with very specific specialties that they're in. You know, in New York, you can be the specialist and have great depth in one thing, but you may not be able to cross over. Right, because we don't know how it's going to interact with your body. And it actually sounds like, I love that you're, you were a former sushi chef and, and, and a cook. It, in a way, with the different dosing, you're like cooking, right? You have right. to see how, the effect of the, right. it on the patient and then, then work with and them. Then go from there. Right. And mm-hmm. as you said, gosh, we're different in the, in the winter, and then in the summer, let alone mm-hmm. 10 years ago, right? So it, right. it really is important, everyone. We want to make sure that you understand that your your body is amazing and yeah. it is alive and it's constantly changing. And right. so you really want to work, not only pay attention to it yourself and be mindful, but really work with your medical experts and professionals to help right. you adjust it. All right. It's a, it's a wonderful, I would say. No, I, can, I, I also see that in terms of being mindful about your pain. So when there's predictability or unpredictability, is it seasonal? Is it seasonal affective disorder? Is it raining outside? I mean, these things do change. I've had patients who just said, I just have pain all the time, 24 seven doesn't stop. Then when we actually pay attention to, is it affecting your sleep? Let's work on the nighttime. Does it affect your daytime? Is it when you're moving? Is it when you're still? Is it better or worse during the day? We can adjust daytime, nighttime, middle of the day, and as needed. Having that foundation of something stable and then having those breakthroughs, then the next step would be, can we prevent your pain rather than being reactive to it? Can we see that something's coming, something's stirring before it gets to the point where now your body's on high alert and now you have to reactively do anything? It's almost like in panic mode. So if we can be more proactive and preemptively treat before it gets to that point, then that would be a more elegant solution than waiting for all the inflammation to just fire off and say, you know what, now I'm in distress. And where do you see the future of medical cannabis? Do you have a, have a dream or a hope for uh, the field? Since you've been in no, it I, since I think, the beginning. I think, you know what, really, I, you know, medical education is going to be important. I think that this will be its own subspecialty. You know, I think there needs to be board certification, not just for all comers. There are people who are prescribing, but I see a lot of second and third opinions. And I see the medically complex. If it's something simple, then it's pretty routine. But now I think there will be a, a specialty board. I, I'm hoping it has to be taught in medical schools. You know, you have a digestive system, a pulmonary system, a, a general urinary system. You have an endocannabinoid system. And there isn't 
enough attention and education. Today, you probably have more information than most doctors out there. Wow. Well, that's thanks to you. Um, Dara, anything that you would like to finish with? You know, just covered it. I think these conversations are really important. I think, you know, we're not only in a very pivotal moment in time and as we proceed in learning about everyday living and lifestyle medicine, um, but it's an entire movement that's changing and we're, we're seeing this unfold right in front of our eyes. I mean, we really are witnessing history as we're going along. So I went into 3,000 years prior, but we're seeing these changes as it goes along. I used to just go year by year with how many prescribers because it used to be like less than a handful and, and now I see more and more. So, you know, I, like, I remember, I just, right? I, I, remember, I remember every single thing because I was the first one to do it. So yeah. I remember it, it's, it's, I think there were like four dispensaries when you first did our, your first lecture or something that was like one and in that New was Jersey. Like a, and I wasn't even <laughs> doing, yeah, I wasn't even doing lectures then. I was, it was maybe a year or two. Cause again, I'm, I'm a very conservative person myself, but I'm very much looking at the ins and outs of the body in terms of kidney disease, but also in terms of medication. So I'm very, very, very prudent. And I think that's why the, the referrals that come to me, I always appreciate, especially when it's a physician's family member that they sure. are now entrust, you know, their care on to me. I so. thought of one last question. There yeah. are a lot of people that are looking online, things are being advertised about you buy these CBD gummies, any, and yet they're expensive. And sometimes mm -hmm. they, you'll join them, it'll be two or $300 a month, right? And you mm -hmm. take some of these, any way, buyer beware, how do, how do you even know if you have a good gummy or not? Or what are, yeah, what are those well, things? They, they've even done studies on the different parts of the gummy, if it's homogenized or not. So the top of the gummy head will be different from the tail if you take it apart. So it's very variable. It's a huge burgeoning industry, a lot of opportunity, very lucrative. And so people will cut costs. It's very concerning in what you're getting and what claims are out there. Even amongst those who are prescribing, there's also variability. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a pleasure. And um, Dara, it's always lovely to see you. I hope yeah, you come back. You. I'd love to talk with you about food as medicine because I know that's a oh. passion of yours. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had that conversation. Anybody else want to hear for that? Can you give me a thumbs up? Yeah, uh, lots of hands raised. So we will have you back. Thank you once again for a very informative and in-depth look at CBD, THC, medical cannabis, and the history and the future of where we're going. Thank right you now. so much. Thank you for everyone's time tonight. Take care, everyone. Be well.